Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I don't normally do this when I preach a sermon, but today I felt like I needed to. Today, you're going to get an introduction. You're going to then get three points. A solid conclusion followed by a prayer. It could be a poem. You could have said poem, but you're getting a prayer. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. I've done this because uh, uh, to preach this way and to be clear with you uh, helps you if you drift off or you decide to write your offertory check or look at your phone, read the Psalms or Catechesis or check the Bible to see if I'm telling the truth. It's just helpful to know where we are in the sermon when you come back to listen. And second of all, because of the topic, you're going to want to know when it's going to end. Now, in this room, I recognize that some of you have been raised Episcopalians. Some of you come from somewhere else, some other tradition of some kind. And some of you were not raised with a tradition of your own. Regardless of where you fit in that kind of grouping, uh, it is still very possible that none of you have been told this uh, very important fact. And that is that we Episcopalians believe in sin. We believe in sin. And though we try to avoid speaking the word sin in every sermon, if at all possible, and we dare not ever bring up the topic, original sin, I intend to do that today. Now, that's your introduction. Point number one, if you're following along, keeping track, because sometimes a preacher will tell you that there's three points, and you only get two, and then you wonder what happened in the next hour when they never end. We cannot understand Paul's letter to the Romans without understanding our Episcopal and Protestant sin talk, as Dr. Stephen Ray talk, uh, speaks of it in his book, Do No Harm fantastic book and unfortunately I just read it and so you're going to get a lot of that today. That is that how we in this church particularly speak about sin is important. We believe we participate in sin. We participate particularly in original sin and that's important as a distinction. This original sin is characterized in the life of Adam and Eve and their children who commit the first murder. And uh, we participate in this sin because we believe all humanity participates in original sin. We are each marked by sin before God. And... Importantly, as Paul reminds us, we are also marked by Christ's resurrection. And we proclaim this at baptism. Paul is telling us that our true identity lies between Adam and the Christ. Between Eve and the Christ, first human. I'm not going to, that's another sermon, okay? We're going to stick with sin this morning. That we cannot be taken away or out of that framework that lies between the first human and Christ. So if each of us has been tainted with sin and resurrected in Christ through his death and burial, we are equally tainted and raised at the same time. Okay? Point number two. 
Therefore, there is no qualitatively different condition of sin. There is only original sin. This is really important. There is no difference between humans when it comes to sin. This means that when we engage with the world and in the world, we cannot be satisfied with rumors, caricatures, or sayings about other people because they're just like us, members of the original sin group, if you will. Every human being has their ultimate identity between the first human being and Jesus. Every Episcopal church's responsibility, therefore, is to welcome like a dragnet. And a dragnet pulls in all kinds of fish, along with flotsam and jetsam, by the way, if you didn't know that. It's a giant mess. That's why it's one of the least efficient ways of fishing. Like a dragnet, the church brings in all people not because of their variety of difference or categories of colors, but because as we do this work, we bring in people who are both sinful and images of Christ. We welcome both the brokenness and sinful parts of human beings in each person as we welcome the Christ that is in them as well. This is not an invitation, of course, for everything goes or a lack of church boundaries. Uh, it is instead the beginning place for all such discussions. It is the beginning place to discuss how we are community together, how we live together. Point number three. I say all of this because there is in our churches subtle understandings that are sneaking in from the side. And these are dangerous. Is that there is some kind of hierarchy of sin. A hierarchy of sins is very popular in other churches. It is not popular here because it's not what we believe. It is not our theology. There is no hierarchy of goodness in this church. And there is no hierarchy of badness. Or whatever the opposite of hierarchy is for badness. There is only a bunch of sinners who find their identity in the first humans as it has been for always and the Christ who has redeemed us. Now, when we act inhumanely to each other, should we confess? Yes, we should. Yes, we should. When we don't live uh, into God's visit, uh, visit uh, envision uh, life for ourselves, should we confess? Yes. Should we change our behaviors to be more Christ-like? Of course we should. We should try to amend our lives. Does God love us any less? No. That's the whole point of the second two readings that we had today. Who are you to decide that somebody is not worthy of Christ's love? You can't even decide that for yourself, for God has poured it out. And if you didn't get it, then read the scripture from the gospel. And the scripture from the gospel, how, what's the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God's like a woman who's going to bake all the bread for a year in one day. It's like a man is going to take everything he has and get a field. It's like it's so big, it's hard to imagine that a person would give everything they have for a pearl. That's God's grace. That's how big it is. And it is for everybody. But a hierarchy of sin does something interesting. It opens the door for us, for you and me, to believe that there are those Worse than us, those more sinful than us, and maybe less loved by God than God loves us. And I wonder how many of us carry this unexamined idea around in our head. 
Now, certainly church hadn't done a good job of kind of dissuading you of this fact, but grandparents, aunts, uncles, parents, siblings, teachers, and employers all do a very good job of helping us begin to believe this idea that we better be good or we won't be loved. We better reach some kind of perfection or we won't be loved. And maybe even that not only will we lack the love and care and humane treatment from those around us, but maybe God will not love us. And this works its way into all kinds of weirdness in community life in the church and outside. And before you know it, why there's some people, those people typically is how it's framed, those people, the irresponsible people, the ones on the margin typically, who are no longer worthy of humane treatment. After all, we might reason if we weren't uh, so caught up in this that, that there is just a moment when God and we can't treat them humanely anymore. A sin talk with hierarchy built in is very dangerous. Why, a time will come, if it hasn't already, when we in the church might even pretend that being with these others, them, them, near them, loving them, caring for them, feeding them, doing good on their behalf, treating them with kindness, would actually be to defile us or the church. That leads to very dark ends indeed. My conclusion. My conclusion, you see, is that there is no other. There is no them. There's just us. There's just us. In Episcopal sin talk, there is just original sin. This sin we share and the Christ we share is what the creeds and the articles of faith make clear. It is what the early church believed. It's what Paul is proclaiming today. It's what Matthew tries to convince us of. It's what Martin Luther and Calvin both preach. It is what Hooker and even Queen Elizabeth I believed as they crafted the first laws for this church. Our founders of the Episcopal Church in this country believed it. And our church believes it still. We believe in original sin as an article of faith because it means equality before God. Who, when looked upon after our last day on this earth, will see us in our true reality with the cross of baptism marked on our foreheads that somehow we lie between the first sinner and Christ himself. Now a prayer. Now, uh, I listen to a lot of music, and it's weird how these things go. And this week I was listening to a favorite song of mine called The Parting Glass, and I was kind of sorting through my library and listening to different parts. And then I found uh, a version of The Parting Glass by We Are The Messengers. And it really struck me. It's got this spoken word poetry at the beginning and uh, just, I just kind of took it in and uh, wrote this prayer uh, for me, but maybe it'll have some meaning uh, for you all. Dear Lord, you know I am not a perfect man. I am not even a good man. Yet through Christ, you have made it so that I am not the sum of my mistakes or the sum of all the good things done. The truth lies in you and not between the two. Lord, I am a man who has been loved well by both God and my family. And so I am grateful. I'm a grateful man. And that is good. So watch over me and watch over us. Watch over family and friends 
And may we walk slow. May we go easy. And love well till we raise the parting glass. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.